So, no, thank you, thank you, Irene, again, and thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here, and I haven't been to Stanford in quite you know, a few years. Last time was maybe three, four, five, maybe more, six, seven years ago. Anyways, yeah. So, um, I took this opportunity to um, present to you uh, something that is very, very new, still pretty much uh, on the making, is a work in progress, uh, like Irene, uh, said it's a new project of mine started about three years ago um, the cultural history of this particular you know the show this particular instrument which i think ties well with what i've been doing on materiality um, because it's uh, the history of an object but it also involves music and sound which is a different type of materiality and uh, and music which is a different type of language and um, the instrument was used to play, uh, you know, was used in uh, uh, particular um, ceremonial and ritual settings, uh, all kinds of, not only like in large orchestra. For example, the, the Chicago shoguns, uh, before they went to battle, they were playing the show. And, and there was this kind of type of music that they were playing while they were being uh, dressed, you know, with the, with the uniform that used to belong to the, the harmor, that used to belong to the Minamoto ancestors. So there is this kind of connection that is uh, very fascinating in many ways and not very, uh, I mean, little known. So um, cultural history of this instrument is taking me in all kinds of directions. And again, this, it's very exciting for me because I know very little about <laughs> pretty much, you know, um, all of this and the one of the directions that uh, the study of Gagaku uh, from the perspective of the show is taking me is the kind of philosophical systems that describe the metaphysic of uh, music uh, and again Gagaku music in particular now as you may know all of you do you I mean, see when I talk about Gagaku people people look at me with like blank faces including in Japan because uh, people know about it but it's not very familiar to I mean most, most people um, so uh, Gagaku basically comes from the imperial music of the Chinese Tang court and uh, is based on, it's basically the music of the Confucian, Confucian system of rites. And uh, in addition, they added like entertainment music for banquets and ceremonies. And in Japan, then intersects with uh, what is known as Gigaku, which is a kind of Buddhi uh, Buddhist uh, popular performing music from like the fifth century. Uh, it's very old. And so you have this confluence of three different genres, which brings me to the topic for today. So one component of the philosophy of music underlying Gagaku is the Confucian system of rights and the, and the Confucian like cosmology, basically. And I can say something more later if there, are, if there is some interest on, on that. The other component, which is pretty much unique to Japan, uh, is the Buddhist uh, understanding of music. Because one of the peculiarities of Japanese gagaku and bugaku is the fact that it was adopted and performed by large temples uh, throughout the country since the late 600s, basically when it was introduced. I mean, Shotoku Taishi apparently is the one who kind of approved, and, uh, and there has been a gagaku orchestra at uh, Tennoji in Osaka since the late 600s. Um, so this sets Japanese gagaku aside from all other types of imperial gagaku in China, in Korea, and Vietnam, where you know, uh, this tradition was known. Because in these other East Asian countries, gagaku is clearly for the emperor, is based on Confucian rituals, and has nothing to do with Buddhism. So in Japan, you have this kind of very anomalous, in, you know, in this respect, um, uh, situation. So the topic for today, what is the Buddhist idea of music. And um, we all know that um, music, I mean, music is really marginal in most Buddhist scriptures. I mean, it is mentioned here and there, but uh, uh, Vinaya, for example, uh, the Vinaya codes uh, criticize music. They clearly say that Buddhist monks and nuns and lay followers are not supposed to play instruments and they're not supposed even to attend musical performances. And I will return to this later, but just to give you, a, you know, a little bit of a framework. Um, then you have the Pure Land scriptures that describe music as being kind of, you know, kind of furnishing in the, in the uh, Amidas paradise. It's kind of, uh, you know, uh, like ambient music in a way, you know, because you have know, music, music everywhere. But, um, but there is no elaboration, pretty much, on uh, what music is in, uh, in, in just, you know, furnishing of the, of the Pure Land. In esoteric scriptures, you have some, something about music, but not really 
much. So again, music was not one of the main concerns of, of Buddhism. And in fact, you see that in most Buddhist traditions, music is really, I mean, there's very little music, basically, especially instrumental music. You have chanting, and, and they can be more melismatic than uh, other forms, but that's like human voice. In terms of musical instruments, pretty much everywhere you only have uh, percussion instruments, and you may have one or two wind instruments, like in Tibet, you have the, what's called the gyaling, or uh, you have the, the long trumpets. Uh, but again, that's pretty much it. And uh, those are not performed, as far as I know, by monks. It's like, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, it's not um, fully ordained uh, monks engaged in, uh, in, you know, in his scholarship or, or asceticism. So again, Japan is an exception because we do have records dating back since very old times in which uh, monks uh, were playing musical instruments and were participating both in court ceremonies and also you know, playing uh, in the ensembles of the temples they belonged to, which generated all kinds of conflict in terms of, you know, uh, is that a kind of a sin? Is that a karmic, uh, and, and, you know, affecting kar karma negatively if you play an instrument, given the, 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 the uh, prohibitions in the, in the Vinaya? So there is one scripture, one, as far as I can tell, uh, that addresses music in a kind of a sustained and extended way. And that is the, in Japanese, is Daiju Kinnara o Shomongyo, which is the sutra of the questions by Druma, king of the Kinnaras. And uh, in uh, Professor Harrison's uh, reconstruction of the Sanskrit, they, it does not exist in Sanskrit anymore, right? Correct me. So it's the Druma Kinnara Raja Paripracha Sutra. Um, it is uh, the, the, the version that I'm going to use today is the, is the translation by Kumarajiva in the early 5th century. And there is an earlier, uh, late 2nd century uh, translation attributed to Lokakshema, but there seems to be, uh, th there are conflicts. I mean, not many people believe now that Lokakshema may have translated it. But, you know, I, I leave a question mark in that, but it's not relevant for our conversation today. But even so, I mean, the fact that a scripture on the Kinnara playing music and being praised by the Buddha, basically, this is what it is, in the second century, it's pretty impressive. You know, it's one of the first things that was translated into Chinese, and they, and they talks positively about music, but it is a very visible and sizable exception. Um, this history, uh, this uh, text, scripture, also has a later history because it is referenced in uh, medieval Japanese sources when they talk about music. And Gagaku professional musicians from the Kamakura uh, 13th century and later, they are reference, referencing this text as one of the examples, you know, the models for their own profession. So it did have an impact on the development of Gagaku and the self-awareness of uh, Gagaku professional musicians. So. Um, I should say that Professor Harrison here has published the, the only book in the world on, uh, on this text, which is a critical edition of uh, in Tibetan, so I have no idea what it is about, in fact. But, uh, <laughs> but it is a critical edition, as far as I can tell from the introduction, which is in English, um, on several versions of the scripture in the Tibetan canon. And, uh, some uh, a comparison also right in the reconstruction with the two existing uh, versions uh, translations in the Chinese uh, canon. I should say that in English, as far as I know, there is nothing else. I may be wrong on the scripture. It's in preparation right now. In English, uh, but it's based on the Tibetan. It's based on the Tibetan. Okay, yeah. So uh, on the on the Chinese version, there's nothing in English. There is one article in German, and maybe four articles in uh, Japanese. So that's all there is. So today I'm trying to say something a little different. I mean, based myself on the existing scholarship, but something a little different. Um, so let me say that the, the sutra of the uh, king of the Kinnaras is, I think, is a unique. I mean, I've read a few, not many, but a few Buddhist scriptures. And this is unique to me in many ways. Um, because it has a rich doctrinal apparatus, it talks about the paramita teachings, ideas of emptiness, there are instructions for the bodhisattvas, which is pretty much standard within this, this uh, type of literature. But then there are visualizations, you know, the samadhi, or the different types of samadhi, with this kind of cosmic visions and magic and, and all that. Um, there is a narrative structure that suggests the existence of conflicting views about uh, practice and about music in particular. 
And I think, you know, to me, that, that the first impression that I got when I read the scripture is the, the sh sheer sense of joy that, that comes out in some passages of the scripture. I don't know if that in the Tibetan version is the same, uh, but it's a secular joy that, that comes from the performance of the music and the dance by the Kinara. And uh, it's not the, the, the pleasure of the Dharma that a lot of you know, uh, members of the audience in sutras experience after the Buddha preaches and they feel, wow, this was cool, you know, that is a sense of bliss. This is really a sense of joy and happiness. You know, the kinar and dancing and, and you have all, all that, which is really, really unusual. So uh, this is very attractive uh, to me. Um, okay, please tell me when it's time to stop. Um, I've been talking all day and I'm not even sure, you know, I don't <laughs> what, what to say now, but I'll try to, st to, to stick to the, to, the, to the text that I prepared. So, um, maybe a brief summary of what the scripture is about. Um, I say that there are maybe three parts. There is a, a, a first a long introduction, and the final section, and the, and the middle section. The, the first and last part are quite standard in terms of setting, you know, as the Buddha is in Rajagriha and with a large audience and is going to preach about uh, emptiness or about the bodhisattvas. And it's quite dry and, if I may say so, dry and dogmatic in the content because it's basically a list of items. So you say there are eight features of the bodhisattva here, there are four things that the bodhisattva must do there, there are 32 aspects of that, there are 16 aspects of that. It's just a list of things. And it's very technical, very advanced, and in fact the Buddha is talking to an advanced bodhisattva. Uh, with, um, it's called at the stage of non-return, so he knows a lot about things, so it really gets into the details. And then, and then you have the kinara who come and they kind of hijack the entire thing, you know, they bring, they bring music and all kinds of, and then they take the Buddhas, the Buddha and the audience to the Himalaya, to their realm, and they entertain the Buddhas, and then the Buddha again starts with this list of things, <laughs> and, the, and the Kinnara again play music, and so there's this kind of contrast between this dry, dogmatic, doctrinal, scholastic component, and the Kinnara who do their own, like, happy thing. Um, Okay, just to give you a like, like more specific uh, idea. So, um, the protagonist of, one of the two protagonists of the scripture is uh, Tengan Bosatsu, Bodhisattva Heavenly Crown, which Professor Harrison reconstructs as uh, Divya Mauli or Deva Mauli. Um, so, he asks questions of the Buddha. You know, he asks, uh, for example, how Bodhisattvas, that's the first one, how Bodhisattvas can acquire an eloquence with many adornments. I'm translating for the Chinese, with all its beneficial effects on the listeners. And that's, uh, yeah, maybe one portion, two portions of the, <laughs> of, the, of the Chinese canon. And then the Buddha replies by enumerating a long set of four item lists. So that's one full page of four things. There's four of these, four of that, four of the other, four of these. And then uh, at the end of this long list of things that are basically meaningless to me, sorry, <laughs> um, then the universe shakes six times. There's this big earthquake, which happens when a big teaching has been uh, expounded, right? And then there's this great light pervading the universe, and uh, all the divinities in the upper realm of the universe, they begin to play celestial music, uh, defined as gigaku in the text, and songs. And then you have the mandara flowers uh, f raining down on the Buddha. And, uh, and next, Tengan Bosatsu asks the Buddha how the bodhisattvas can be able to listen, uphold, chant, or copy this speech after the Buddha's nirvana. Again, this is an important teaching because, again, you have all these cosmic manifestations. So the Buddha replies with a set of eight items. So there are these and that and that. And then the universe, again, sh you know, shakes six times. You have all the mountains collapsed into rivers, lakes, and the ocean. Um, so everything becomes beautifully decorated. Plants and trees in the universe bend towards the Buddha and produce flowers and fruits. And then all the celestial beings begin to play again all kinds of music. And from the Himalaya, Himalaya you can see again another beautiful kind of music that is coming. And all plants rain petals on the Buddha. Um, and then Shariputra asked the Buddha, hey, what's going on here? What, what is this thing? And, uh, and the Buddha says, well, you know, this is a sign that Druma, the king of the Kinara, is really interested in what I'm saying, so he's coming to see us. 
And as soon as he stops talking, then King Nara, you know, the king uh, and his retinue, um, comes and pays respect to the, to the Buddha. Uh, plays, he's announced by 84,000 types of music. So again, this is another thing, the enormous variety of music that is being played. It's not just, you know, any like ambient, you know, like um, thing. With pure songs, harmonious music, and um, so they come, they, they made petals rain from the sky, they went to the Buddha, bowed, and so forth. And then King Druma is there, pulls out his uh, lapis lazuli koto, that's, you know, it's a, it's a chin in Chinese, you know, like, and beautiful decorated and so forth. Apparently it was made by Vishmakarman. Is it the same in, in Tibetan? Vishmakarman made the thing, the, the instrument? I will have to check that, but then. So he begins to play the cot, uh, the cot, well, the cot. I think in Sanskrit it's Avina, in fact, you know, that's the instrument that is associated with the, uh, there was no sitar at the time, right, in India. I mean, sitar comes from Persia, it's a much later instrument. So he um, begins to play the koto, accompanied by his retinue, and the sound, you know, covers, you know, resonates throughout the universe, covers the celestial music being played by the gods, who stop playing and, and begin to listen. And then you have all the plants and trees in the universe become to sway, following the rhythm. And then all the members of the Buddha's audience, you know, the Shravaka, everybody, they begin to dance, following the, mu the music of, of King Druma. They, uh, I'm quoting here, they abandon their dignified deportment as if following this lascivious music. They were like children dancing and playing and could not hold themselves. There's only one exception, the, the Bodhisattva, the most advanced stages, and they are totally you know, un unresponsive to music. And one of them is, of course, uh, Tengan, you know, the, the, the one of the, the two protagonists. Bodhis and Tengan says, hey, he, he goes to Mahakashyapa and says, hey, well, hey, you guys, you venerables, you know, what, what are you doing? You are detached from the Kleshas, you have attained the eight liberations and have seen the four noble truths. Why are you abandoning your dignified deportment and dance, shaking your body like children? And they reply, we can control ourselves. Because of this koto music, we cannot sit quietly and we can keep our bodies from dancing and our minds can focus. And then Tengan asks again, Mahakashapa, but you know, you're venerated by men and asuras like, like a stupa, you know, and you can hold yourself, you know, you're behaving like a child, well, what's going on here? And Mahakashapa says, you know, look, it's like trees in a forest shaken by a powerful storm. They can just stand still. It's something independent of our mind's desire. I just can resist this rhythm. The music of the Kinara king with his koto and songs, the sounds of wind instruments, shake my mind like trees in a storm and, and can stand still. So, so then, uh, so this is interesting, right? The power of music, which is not really elaborated upon in this, you know, but it's kind of take, taken for granted. And then King Druma begins to play a music that spoke a song about emptiness, which is like about uh, two, two, two quarters, um, two thirds of a page. And, uh, and then Tengan asks the Bodhisattva again, asks the Buddha, where does this beautiful song come from? And the Buddha replied, well, don't ask me, ask the Druma, you know, he, he will tell you. Which again is interesting because the, the, the Buddha is authorizing, he was empowering Druma to talk about doctrinal matters on his behalf, which means that Druma knows what, you know, what, what things are about, and Druma is able to talk directly to an advanced uh, bodhisattva, which is, I think is a kind of strong, very powerful endorsement of, of this musician. So, so Tengan asks, uh, so where does this music come from? And King Druma says, well, the song comes from the musical voice. Musical voice is a difficult translation, but in Chinese is onjo, I mean, the Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese is onjo, which is sound and, and voice. So it's not speech, it's kind of a singing voice. So it's a musical voice, that's how we render it, but of sentient beings. To which Tengan says, where does the musical voice of sentient beings come from? And King Druma, the musical voice of sentient beings, originates from empty space. And Tengan, doesn't musical voice originate in the mouth? Which again, show, this shows that, you know, how little Tengan knows about music and cares about music. Uh, and Druma, well, says, no, the musical voice of sentient beings originates from the body and from the mind. And Tengan, no, because the body is not intelligent. 
It's like plants and stones, right? It just sits there. And, and the mind is formless and there's no vision or touch. It doesn't make speeches. It's like an apparition. So, of course, it doesn't make any music, the mind. And Ruma, well, if it is separate from body and mind, where does, it, where does the music come from? And Tengan comes from ideation, creates music and sound. Um, uh, so this conversation continues for, you know, for a while, but then uh, Druma explains, and here I've abridged the translation because, you know, it gets long, and he says, all sounds do emerge from empty space, which this is an Indian theory, right? You know, it's the cosmic sound that pervades, you know, permeates the entire universe. Sound has the nature of emptiness. This is Druma again speaking. When you finish hearing it, it disappears, and after it disappears, it abides in emptiness. Therefore, all dharmas, when they are taught or not, sorry, whether they are taught or not, are emptiness. All dharmas are like sound. If one teaches the dharmas through sound, the dharmas cannot be attained in sound. All dharmas cannot be said, only the sound is called speech. Therefore, sound is originally non-abiding anywhere, which means, I think, is not substantial. Thus, thus, it is not real and solid. Its reality is only in name then its reality is indestructible because if it is anywhere to be found and it does not originate and therefore does not extinguish itself and therefore it's pure, immaculate, incorruptible like light, like mind. It is transcendent and beyond science. So basically here Druma is arguing that the sound, is pretty, the, the nature of sound is like the nature of emptiness because, you know, and, and therefore all dharmas are like sound, you know, the, because they originate and they dissipate and when they dissipate there's nothing in them that is substantial, but at the same time it presupposes that there is a, a dimension, dimension of emptiness in which sound is kind of latent and, and can be activated or not. This is another theory that comes from Indian uh, theories of sound and music of the... Um, eternal persistence of a potential sound that can be activated or not. We find it in the Mimamsa and things like that. And they were known in, well, this is a Chinese text, but they were known in China and also in Japan, Kukai. Kukai also writes about them. So here in all this, okay, here there's also something about semiotics, but maybe I can skip it and maybe we can go back about that later. So Tengan is astonished when he hears all this because he says, well, how is it possible that Druma knows such, you know, such deep and wondrous things? He has so powerful jinzurik, you know, the, the, the supernatural powers, and he's so capable to express such a profound teaching. And they say, well, the Buddha says, you know, well, Druma has practiced, you know, has been practicing Buddhism for, for, for many, 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 many years, you know, under different Buddhas. Uh, and then again, here he continues. Let me skip some, some, some things. Um, okay, then... Uh, Buddha says that Druma is very capable in the Upaya. He has acquired the great wisdom of Upaya. And because of that, with the sound of his music, Druma can subdue and make abide in enlightenment. 700 million Kinnaras subdue and keep in, supreme, in the supreme path 300 million Gandharvas and so forth. So this indicates that King Druma, because of his deep knowledge of the techniques of Upaya, is able to use the intrinsic power of music for purposes related to Buddhist salvation. So this is something interesting, right? It's not just in, to entertain the Buddha. I mean, he can use music to, you know, push forward a, a Buddhist agenda of salvation. Um, now, again, this is me again, it's not the scripture, but we never know from the scripture clearly what the power of music is. You know, it's just taken for granted. We know that it's similar to emptiness, probably that is the connection. The music, music is really an embodiment, it's a, the perfect manifestation of the essence of emptiness and therefore it comes with all the benefits and merits associated with it. Um, and then uh, still Tengan, the Bodhisattva, is not convinced and asks the Buddha, but uh, how is it that Druma, how can Druma with his music and songs, which we know, you know uh, are not good, right? How can he teach ascension beings? And then the Buddha explains, well, the Kinnaras, like the Gandharvas and the Mahoragas, love music. With their music, they arouse great love, belief and respect for the Dharma, which in turn generates the sounds of the three jewels. He really talks about the sound of the Buddha, the sound of the Dharma, and the sound of the Sangha. The sounds of the Paramitas, and the sounds of a number of Dharmas, and there's a, kind of a long list. Um, so then we have a cosmic vision. 
which we have again this kind of old thing like encomp encompassing the whole world with music and light and flowers everywhere. Um, and then the King Druma is in Samadhi and he does all that. It's, it's Druma who does that. So he, he has a mastery over several Samadhi. And while in Samadhi, Druma invites the Buddha to his kingdom in the Himalayas and say, hey, Buddha, I would like to, you, know, you to visit us and would like me to let me entertain you. And Buddha says, sure, let's go. So again, the joy of the kinar explodes. So they begin to sing and dance and sing and dance and play music. And, and so they create another cosmic thing. So um, um, sorry, this is Tengan who makes his own magic. He enters the Samadhi, creates a cosmic size jewel platform and invites the Buddha and all the uh, assembly to sit in that little thing that he carries in his own hand and they fly to the Himalayas. And when they arrive, again, the kinnara kind of explode in joy, you know, with this music and dance and, so and songs, uh, serve this beautiful banquet, you know, with delicious food, all these aromas and perfumes and beautiful music. And, uh, and then you have the Buddha who creates, because of his, of his supernatural powers, he creates a song accompanied with music in which the Bodhisattvas replies to all doubts. And I will have to look into this. But again, the, it's interesting that Buddha is able to create music because, again, he's dealing with the Kinnara in this particular context. And then, okay, so the next, next you have the numerous wives and ladies in attendance of uh, King Druma who come, uh, pay obeisance to the Buddha, and they ask him how they can get rid of their female body and acquire a male body which is a common theme you know, in the Lotus Sutra and also in other Mahayana texts. And this may be the first text, uh, Lokakshema's version, in which this topic comes up, I think. This has never been mentioned you know, in scholarship that deal with this particular topic. So the Buddha says, okay, no, you have, well, basically you have to follow the precepts, you have to follow the right behavior, and especially you have to realize you know, uh, uh, that everything is empty. You know, everything, um, emptiness is everywhere. That means that you, know, you acquire a male body, even if you don't really change your female body. So it's kind of an interesting interpretation. And then there is a prophecy in which the Buddha, uh, no, sorry, in which the wives will be reborn into Sita heaven, serve Maitreya, and uh, come back to this world when he becomes Buddha, serve, and eventually they will become Buddhas themselves. And Buddha, and Druma himself will become a Buddha uh, much, much later in time and rule over his own Buddha land. Um, and then we have a revelation about, you know, why that is so, because Druma himself served under a Buddha playing music for, for a long, long time, and therefore that he acquired merit that opened the path for him to become a Buddha himself in the future. Then you have the sons, uh, the princes, right, of, of King Druma, who come to the Buddha, pay obeisance, and say, hey, you know, we really want to, you know, become Buddhists. We really want to attain liberation. So teach us how to stop playing music. I mean, t teach us what we have to do. And the Buddha says, no, no, you don't have to stop playing music. You know, your music produces 64 sounds that protect the wondrous dharma of enlightenment. So you don't have to abandon making music. And he lists, you know, what these 64 sounds are. So basically, each dharma, each thing that he talks about has a sound. And then King Druma thought that the Buddha would like to go back. So again, with the supernatural power, he creates a jewel flying chariot, and he puts him in his hand and takes them over to Rajgriha, and they descend. And King, we have King Ajatashatru who comes and welcomes them back. So you have a lot of you know, secondary figures who come. There's a short conversation between the king and uh, Druma. And, um, and then Teng, and then the, the Kinnara leave, and then you have Tengan who asks the Buddha, so now we go back to normality, uh, normalcy. How many dharmas a bodhisattva has to achieve in order to become a dharma vessel? So there's another list of 22 items. And then uh, another list. And then Ajatashatru asks, and there's another uh, thing coming out. And then Indra comes, the four heavenly general comes. Um, the Buddha teaches a mantra to subjugate all superhuman beings, you know, the Kinnar, the Mahogaraga, with evil intentions. And he, and he praises the merits of the Sutra, and there is a final celebration, and uh, the Sutra is over. 
I hope it was not too boring, but you know, this is the, <laughs> I, I've edited the, you know, amply, but. Hmm? <laughs> okay, now let me tell you if we still have uh, some more time, right? Um, kind of a literary study of the scripture, right? You know, if we take the scripture as it was like a text that we try to study, you know, the structure and everything, well, what can we get? Well, first of all, I think this is a medley of, very, of two very different scriptures, right? Each has a different language, a style, imagery, content, and audience. And uh, I would say that the first scripture, the kind of the first portion is, let's call it Tengan's Sutra, right? Because he's the protagonist and he asks the questions and he gets the answers that he wants. And the other one is Druma's Sutra because he's the protagonist of the second portion. And of course they intersect, right? Because they, they go to the Kinara's place, they intersect with each other, and then, and then there's a separation again. So, um, so Tengan's Sutra is for, like I said at the beginning, for advanced bodhisattvas. It deals with profound and abstruse aspects of scholastic teachings and is written in an abstract and detached tone. Like I said, it's essentially a list of items, very technical. And detachment is especially obvious in Tengan's reaction to the Shravaka's dancing to the music of the Kinar. He does not really understand what's going on there. He's completely remote, you know, Tengan, from the realm of the senses that cannot even understand, you know, why the Shravaka, you know, the, the Shravaka state of mind let alone their, their, their emotions. And, and Tengan even asks the Buddha about music, you know, what is this thing? Why is music so powerful? He has no idea, he has no interest in it, right? Um, now the second scripture, the second portion uh, of the medley, Druma's Sutra, is very different. He talks about central Buddhist teachings, but in ways that can be beneficial, no sorry, not only beneficial, but also attractive to many beings at different spiritual stages. So we have the Kindruma, his consorts and his children, right? All lay people with different spiritual capacities and soteriological concerns. You know, Kindruma is on his way to becoming a Buddha. His consorts ask, ask how to get rid of the female body, right, and become man. Um, and his male children inquire on how to seriously engage with Buddhism. So there are different stages that have different concerns and the Buddha teaches them. Um, so, I would say that the content of Druma's portion of the Sutra addresses broader philosophical and cultural matters. There is a philosophy of music somehow, you know, the idea of the salvific power of music, the, the, its connection with emptiness, um, the role of, you know, the fact that music can be beneficial. Um, also, and then you have the Samadhi, then you have women, and then you have uh, young men and so forth. The structure of this portion is not linear, it's not a linear sequence and detached, you know, uh, dispassionate uh, sequence of lists, but it is probably something similar to a musical composition with different themes, you know, the various subjects. And they end in a sort of crescendo uh, towards the end when the, the prophecy of, of uh, Drumas eventually becoming a Buddha is, is uh, expounded. And then you have a coda, a quiet coda, right, when the, when the Kinara leave and go back. And to me, that sounds like a Bugaku piece, right? It starts slow, then it grows up, and then you have different themes, you have repetitions, and then you have the crescendo, which is pretty fast, and then you have the code at the end, when the sound fades out and the dancers, you know, leave, which is pretty much, you know, similar to, I mean, maybe I'm over-reading this, but... Um, and again, like I said, I would like to emphasize, you know, the, the, the joy, the sheer joy and sensory bliss of the Kinnaras, as, as expressed by the music and dance. Um, so, this is not just two different things, you know, clashing, but I think it is a well-crafted attempt to present a complex set of teachings to a wide and diverse audience, something that would be interesting to both scholastic exegetes and a wider secular audience. Um, now, there are, I think, three elements in the scripture that are particularly re relevant for us. One is Buddha's acceptance of King Druma's invitation to visit his realm and be entertained by him. You know, so he says, you know, I don't care about music. No, no, he's, he's happy to go and interact with them. Um, then the fact that the Buddha explicitly authorizes King Druma to speak on his behalf in, in, doctrine, in, term, you know, in, in a matter of doctrine into crucial moments. And then the third is, is when the Buddha makes himself, you know, is able to create music indirectly through the power of his, you know, supernatural, through his supernatural powers. So one could say that this scripture is an attempt to represent non-duality, you know, silent asceticism versus music performance, ascetic rigor versus sensorial experience, scholasticism 
and art. I think it is also a powerful endorsement of music as a proper Buddhist activity. But, this, but again, the sutra is um, kind of ambiguous, right? Because it only speaks about the celestial music of the Kinnaras. He never says that humans are fine you know, to, play, to play music. Um, and medieval Japanese exegesis would bridge this gap and give an important role to a certain type of human music, you know, the court music of Gagaku. Um, but before I get into that, maybe I can say a few things about music in uh, Buddhist attitudes in music. Uh, do you still have time? Is that okay? Um, I just mentioned it at the very beginning. I just can elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, early Buddhist sources have negative views on music, you know, like uh, Zoitsu Agonkyo. Um, the eighth precept, you know, for the for the abstinences uh, that lay followers must adopt in the days of observance, um, the eighth precepts enjoins to avoid making music and smearing one's body with perfumes. It's the same thing, you know, but it's kind of pleasurable activity. The same sutra prohibits music and nuns, uh, sorry, pro prohibits monks and nuns from discussing music, singing, and dance because these subjects, along with wine drinking and comedy, are not appropriate for them. So monks are not supposed to deal with this kind of, you know, like pop artists or singers or. Um, then uh, Joe Agonkyo lists among the causes of financial ruin losing oneself in music. And the Vinaya codes are explicit, you know, in uh, prohibition of music. And again, mood, music is forbidden because it is related to sensual pleasure, and as such, it leads to inordinate behavior and is therefore a major obstacle to Buddhist practice. So, this is probably what the, the, the early part of the sutra uh, refers to when, when, you know, the, 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 the Shravaka and all the others, you know, begin to dance and can con cannot control themselves. However, the early sutras already mention chanting of the scriptures as a positive uh, activity. And uh, there are praises you know, of a clear and penetrating voice, or like the beauty of the voice of the singer. So that was something that was already there. But again, there's always the possibility of an excess. Um, Zoitsu Agonkyo describes a fight among the disciples of Magdalayana and Ananda as to which of the two has the best, the most beautiful voice. It's again, the beauty of the voice is good, but the fact that people are fighting to determine who is, so that is disruptive, and the for music is always kind of a double-edged thing. But early scriptures already show a positive attitude towards music, singing, and dancing when they are performed as offerings to the Buddha. So that is okay, especially if lay patrons decide that they want to do a music celebration for the Buddha, that's fine as long as the monks and nuns don't participate actively in them. But it's possible for them to sit them because it's kind of required. I guess this is like meat eating, right? If they receive an offering of meat, they, they eat it, right? Although it's, they're not supposed to do it out of, you know, for themselves. Um, now, Mahayana scriptures have, um, like I said before, a more positive attitude because um, Playing music can bring one to become a Buddha. There's a precedent in the Lotus Sutra, uh, Myon uh, Bosatsu plays music and he will become a Buddha um, uh, at some point. The Konko Myo Kyo also describes the virtues of Benzaiten's voice because they bring merit and therefore they help people to attain salvation. Pure land, like I said, presence of music is everywhere and music is kind of a reiterating the scriptures but in a different language. So it's not in Sanskrit, but it's musical form, but still the, 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 the scriptures are being preached through music. And there is a passage that I have to verify. Sorry, I mean, like I said, this is pretty much a work in progress, but um, heavenly music in the Pure Land is not only an adornment of the Pure Land, but a veritable manifestation of the Buddha Mida endowed with the power to lead beings to the land of bliss. So again, this would be music as, an embody, as a manifestation of the Buddha. So it is more than just furnishing of the world. And in Buddhist scriptures, again, uh, music is one of the offerings that are accepted. Uh, the biwa is, um, is a substitute body, uh, samaya gyo, for uh, benzaiten, which is a new development because you know, normally you have stupas, you have like chakras and stuff, but the biwa is also one of these, mag uh, these not magic, these kind of supernatural entities. 
Um, there seems to be a distinction, though, uh, between human music and heavenly music on the one hand, and secular music and music as a Buddhist offering on the other hand in Buddhism. So uh, depending on which part of the poles you are, then it could be allowed or not. And perhaps this uh, scripture of Druma is probably a, an attempt to bridge those because we have a heavenly music, which is kind of secular in purpose because it's you know, for entertainment. And at the same time, um, it's a music that is entertaining, entertaining, but it's also an offering to the Buddha. So this scripture tries to bring together these four different poles uh, towards a kind of a middle. One word about uh, music itself in the scriptures. Now, the Chinese translations of the scriptures mention a wide variety of instruments. Um, and all of them were actually being played in China at the times in which the sutras were translated, and most of them still exist in Japan in the Shosoin. And many of them are still part of the Gagaku tradition. So this is part of a, of a live uh, thing. Now, I don't read Sanskrit, so, and again, a lot of the scriptures are not, don't, no longer exist in Sanskrit, but uh, some scholars in Japan have done a comparison, um, apparently um, say that the Sanskrit terminology for the musical instruments is much poorer than the Chinese rendition. So you have only one term like, uh, what is that, uh, um, uh, Vamsa, that's bamboo, and that refers to wind instruments, but in China you have like a list of 10 different instruments. Um, you have, uh, I don't know, uh, vina, and in Japan, uh, in China, you have the biwa, you have the koto, you have uh, different types of koto and so forth. So you have a proliferation of instruments. Which, um, what do we get from this? Um, I think that, I think that the translators, I mean, the, their goal was not that of passing on information on contemporary Indian music, um, but they wanted to convey some sense of the celestial music and the novelty and variety of, of this music by you know, listing all these kind of wondrous and recently imported instruments. Um, many of them, in fact, come to China from other parts of the world. And I think that the crucial consequence of that translation decision was that a specific type of music that was popular at the time, which in Japan is known as gigaku, which was associated with Buddhism and was most likely of foreign origin, came to signify the celestial music of the Kinnara and the Pure Lands at the same time. So I think that the instruments that are listed in the Chinese translations open up a kind of a space of lift practice between doctrinal speculations and uh, and established formal uh, ceremonies and this kind of, can you call it popular you know, attitude that are going on? I mean, Gigaku bands apparently, you know, they were going around and participating in a temple ceremonies. There are references to this in, 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 in texts from the fifth, sixth, seventh century. And so this is really part, and, 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 and they are the origins perhaps of the, of the funeral bands that you find you know, in Taoist temples today in China, and at the same time at uh, you know, the Gagaku for the, for the Japanese court. So this is a kind of a long lasting tradition. There are a lot of studies about you know, how Gigaku is related to Gagaku in Japan, but, but we can certainly see that you know, some of the repertoire of Gigaku is still present in Gagaku today, and, uh, and the origin is, uh, whatever it is, then they conf you know, there's a confluence at some point uh, in the um, early Heian period, I think, when, when these things come together. And I think that this is, uh, this is a discovery for me because it's always been unclear to me why Gagaku music was envisioned in Japan, you know, in the paintings of the Pure Land as the music of the Pure Land. Because the scriptures don't really say that, you know, the, the, in the Pure Land they play Gagaku. But in Japan, when they make the paintings of the Raigo, you know, the rival, you know, of the, the advent of the Buddha Amida to save, you know, the, the dying person, there are always bodhisattvas playing Gagaku. I mean, those are Gagaku instruments, you cannot mistake them. And, and it is possible that, you know, the fact that this kind of sacred music associated with the Kinnara and the others were defined as Gigaku, which we know was the ancestor of Gagaku, played with the same instruments, made it obvious to the Japanese that that was the kind of music 
that they were thinking about. I wonder if there are some similar representations of the Pure Land uh, in China or in other parts of the world, and what kind of music, what kind of instruments they, they, they adopt. But in Japan, it was pretty clear that that was the music of the Pure Land. And you find them in many other paintings. You find like a, I've seen a beautiful, uh, what's it called, like a, a painting of Tushita Heaven, uh, the recently at the Nezu Museum in Tokyo from the Muromachi period, and there are like two or three different stages where musicians are performing Gakaku and Bugaku, you know, in, in, in Tushita. And so it's clear that that was the thing. And to conclude uh, with, a, with a few words, so that is also what the medieval musicians, uh, how the musicians identify themselves, you know, they're continuing the, the work of the Kinara by creating music as an offering to the Buddha, and also for the protection of the state, you know, in case of the emperor and for the temples, you know, but that's what the Kinara were doing. So, they could claim that you know, their act of you know, music performance, music practice, was a meritorious act, you know, activity that would build up Buddhist merit. At the same time, that's interesting, because the same text that talks about this is by Koma by Chikazane, uh, late Kamakura, early Kamakura, uh, sorry, uh, mid Kamakura period. Uh, Koma uh, Chikazane is a famous Gagaku dancer from Kofukuji. Uh, and, um, and he says, yes, we are playing the music of the Kinnara and so forth, but you know, our music, our world as musicians is also the world of the Asuras. Because you know, there was a constant struggle, you know, who gets the first seat, you know, who is the first Hichiriki, who is the first show. And it was a matter of survival for the families, you know, whom do you teach the instrument to whom and, and how. So it, it, it is not a peaceful environment, you know, and then if you don't have enough disciples, your tradition, you know, uh, disappears, so the children of your cousin will, you know, take over, and your family will be disbanded. So a lot of this was going on in, the, especially in the Muromachi period, when Gagaku is really kind of uh, uh, in danger of, uh, of, you know, for, for its survival. So the musicians are aware that there is a lot of struggle and competition. People are struggling for fame, for recognition, for worldly benefits, and those are certainly not Buddhist virtues. And that's why they also begin to emphasize that, you know, yes, we do serve the Buddha with our art, but our art also implies these kind of negative things that require re being, you know, re redressed by specific Buddhist practice. And in fact, you see a shift between the uh, Gagaku uh, texts written uh, in the 1200 and those written in the 1500s, where um, the danger of music and the fact that you really have to practice Buddhism seriously because music is dangerous, uh, uh, you know, are, are emphasized. In terms of, one last thing, in terms of the justification for music, it's interesting to me that uh, in Japan they use the same term kyogen kigyo, which was used by um, Bojui to justify writing poetry in China. Because uh, writing poetry is criticized by the Vinaya, you know, because you are using ornate, flourishing words, talking about love and drinks, uh, which are kind of negative, you know, clashes that you don't want to emphasize as a Buddhist. And, uh, and Bojui says, we know, yes, uh, that's what they did, but they also tried to put some Buddhist elements in my poetry. So, you know, I was trying to serve the Buddha and the cause of Buddhism. So the same terminology that is applied to literary arts also gets applied to music. And I think there's always been a constant uh, intersection between music and poetry from the term onjo, like I said before, sound or, or musical voice, and um, Indian theories of music as a derivation of the fundamental cosmic sound that pervades uh, everything. And uh, so they, in Japan, they adapt uh, Kyogen Kigyo, and they say that Kangen, uh, Ojo, I mean, uh, yes, uh, so Kangen, uh, instrumental music, is one of the paths to attain rebirth in the Pure Land. Uh, so that's late Heian, Kamakura, Kamakura period. So I think I'll stop here. I mean, I don't have any specific conclusion, but you know what, I, maybe I can summarize a little bit some of the main arguments. This is a very interesting scripture, I think, because it addresses, you know, you know uh, in full, directly, the importance of music, and it comes up with, it kind of celebrates music as a direct embodiment and manifestation of emptiness, and therefore it opens up the possibility of musical practice and performance as a viable uh, form of, music, of Buddhist practice. Um, at the same time, I think this emphasis, this uh, 
emphasis on the instruments, on the actual instruments in China, not in India, again, uh, describes this kind of burgeoning world. I'm thinking of the book uh, by Victor Mayer, Painting and Performance, where you have this itinerant performance and uh, telling stories and showing images. He doesn't, uh, Mayer doesn't talk about music. It's just mentioned in passing. But you know, music was accompanying these kind of performances. So it's kind of, it's very fluid and we know very little about it, but it spread all over Eurasia. And again, it made, the, you know, it went into Japan. Uh, in the uh, late 600s. So I think that this is also what they are describing. And in somehow, somehow this kind of lived uh, musical performance got you know, kind of elevated in Japan through its association with Gagaku. And then he made it possible for Gagaku to be associated with the temples, shrines, the imperial court, of course, and also at the same time with the music of the of heavens and the pure lands. And uh, so this is where I am at the moment, and I stop here, and I really thank you for your attention so far. Thank you.